it is to bring expertise like Yared and others who have some knowledge on uh, on the Nile and also other transboundary water management issues. So we'll talk about mainly uh, science and data-based uh, research results, uh, mainly to uh, help the negotiations and the discussions, the collaborations and the cooperations among the Nile Basin countries. So uh, today's presentation is not different from the others. It's all about uh, uh, having the same goal and objective. So as you know, this uh, webinar uh, is organized by uh, FIUS, for International Universities Institute of the Environment, where myself and Candice, who is also leading the coordination, are part of it. And uh, also co-sponsored and organized by Addis Ababa Institute of Technology at Addis Ababa University, the Bahadur Institute of Technology, where Yarid is actually working at and also studying in the Water and Land Resource Center at Addis Ababa University, and also the Nile Basin Discourse. If you're in institutions and organizations who are working closely with transboundary water management issues would like to co-organize, please let me know. Uh, we can work together uh, on this. So uh, today's talk is about Eastern Nile system under three different water apportionment alternatives. So uh, Yarin is going to talk about the three different scenarios, the colonial era, which is more or less what's going on now. And then the Washington DC document, which was part of the negotiations or the discussion that was there uh, about a year or so ago. And then of course, there is an equitable uh, share formula that uh, a lot of us have been uh, actually talking about. So under these different scenarios, what does the uh, Eastern Nile uh, water apportionment look like? That will be a, a talk that Yari is going to take us through. So to say a few words, Yarin is a PhD candidate at Bahadur University in Ethiopia. Thank you, Yarin, again for joining us and for leading this discussion. So Yarin is a PhD student in the Water Resource Engineering and Management, Bahadur of Technology and Bahadur University. This is a program uh, that was actually launched uh, when I was uh, uh, a Fulbright Scholar and uh, on my sabbatical leave when I was at Bahadur University. And uh, I'm very happy to see Students like Yared and others are actually graduating from this program. He is also a product of Bada University. He's undergraduate in 2009 and his master's in 2012 was also from BDU, Bada uh, University, uh, under the Institute of Technology. And he's also uh, an employee uh, within the same institute. So I'll be moderating this. Uh, to, uh, we have few upcoming webinars. So please mark your calendar and also we'll send also reminders. Uh, there is a special panel discussion that uh, we uh, are planning to do on August 31st. Again, the same time, 8 a.m. New York time. Uh, and this is mainly about data sharing and information exchange in the face of upcoming guard operation and management. So I think this is really very critical. This is very important uh, when you have uh, reservoirs and dumps downstream, and then we have also one of the largest dump upstream. There has to be a continuous information exchange and data sharing on uh, on planning and also operations and the management of particularly GERD and also others. So we have assembled uh, panel members from Wosano Abito, who is a, a principal engineer and water in, uh, at Water and Environment Consulting, uh, with so many years of experience here in South Florida, but also. He has done some good amount of work in the Nile Basin. We have Mohamed Bashir, which you know him. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Manchester, originally from Sudan. And he, he knows the reservoirs and the dams of uh, uh, Sudan. And he has done some quite good amount of work over there. And then we have Alam Gabriel. If you remember, he presented, uh, uh, I believe, last month on, uh, uh, on some of his work, uh, particularly on the GERD related and also uh, flood issues. It's going to be on, he is part of the water resource, uh, uh, he's, he's part of the WSP USA and he has been working under different capacities and currently he's a director of the uh, water resource program. Kevin is from the University of Oxford. Uh, he's a research fellow, if you remember last month's uh, presentation, he was the one who actually moderated it and he has done a lot of work not only in the Nile Basin, but also in other transboundary uh, basins uh, here in uh, North America. 
Uh, I'll be moderating and uh, Dr. Abdul Karim Said, uh, you might know him, he's a Deputy Executive Director and Head of the Basin Wide Program on Nile Basin Initiative. Uh, he, has, uh, he has led the uh, decision support system of the NBI and he knows what uh, data means, he knows what data sharing means. So he'll be also co-moderating along with me. And then uh, our Magdalawit uh, Masai uh, will be also presenting on September 13th at 8 a.m. again, same time. Uh, it is mainly evaluating international transboundary water management practices for contextual lessons for the Nile Basin. So the whole point was what did other countries do and then still they're okay and they, uh, they live peacefully with their transboundary basin countries. So uh, she's going to uh, extract information and experience uh, from all these uh, ground boundary water basin countries that have successfully uh, shared the common good uh, with very minimal uh, issues. And then on October 8th, we have Professor Assad uh, Shamsuddin. He's an associate professor from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, on October 8th, he's going to talk about uh, GERD, particularly uh, he mentioned there are underreported issues on GERD impact on Sudan. So he's going to talk about uh, what are the impacts of GERD on the Sudanese uh, water resource uh, programs, dams, reservoirs. So uh, he'll talk to us on October 8th. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Assad, for your interest to uh, give this talk. Again, reminders, this will be uh, video recorded, so please be aware, and it's gonna be shared uh, to our uh, participants. Please mute your microphone for the duration of the presentations. Once the presentation is over, then you can actually unmute and then ask questions. Uh, and also, you can also send uh, comments to the model, which is myself, and then we can actually entertain. Okay, uh, so as you know, this is about water apportionment under three different scenarios. Uh, and uh, we have been talking about uh, the Nile Basin, particularly in terms of guard filling and operations. Uh, but really to be frank with you, the central point or the central issue, or I can say the quagmire that the Nile Basin countries are facing is not about filling of the dam or operations, it's about water sharing. So this is really very critical and very important. So uh, the question is, you wanna have a binding agreement first before the water sharing or is this the three countries versus the 11 Basin countries? This is really uh, very important for us to actually consider. So who has the right to actually talk about water sharing? 11 countries of the Basin countries or the three Basin countries? Uh, in principle, this should have been done a long time ago when the uh, CFA was actually uh, drafted and later on uh, accepted by so many of the Basin countries, but we are still uh, have not yet reached to that point. So today, the yeah, is going to talk about these three different scenarios, the, the status quo and then the Washington document that was presented during the discussion, and of course, the equitable share, which most Basin countries and uh, are actually accepting that should be uh, the basis for water sharing within the Nile Basin. With that, now I will leave uh, the, the floor for Yarid. And uh, Yarid, do you want me to run your slide from here? Well, I think you can do it. Uh, hopefully, if your internet connection is good, you can do it from there. Uh, do you want me to do it from here for you? Yes, you can display it for me and then I can, uh, I can manage okay. from here. Okay, okay, let me see now. Okay. Uh, can this, can we give him a control to Yared of his slides? I, he can run it from here. Um, yes, let me, he is a co-host, um, so. He's going to click and then. Uh, yep. And then he should be able to uh, run the slides. Yarid, can you try? Your mouse, move your mouse to the bottom left corner and then you will see some arrows that you can use. If you look at the top of your screen, there's a request remote control. It says view options, click on that and then go to request remote control. And then you're gonna click on the slide and it should allow you to move the slides yourself. 
Okay. okay, I approved it for you. You can go ahead and up. It takes like five seconds. There we go. <laughs> No, it's not. It's not allowing me to do. It's still your slide that is uh, working. Yeah, Asefa, we're seeing your PowerPoint um, from the intro section. There Can we you go. Speak now? Yep. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's still my my mouse is not working. Okay. Uh, we have given you the remote control. Uh... Oh, let me double request you. Okay, let me approve it again for you, okay? Yeah, I think it works. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Asafa, for your generous introduction. I really apologize the, the, the participant for, uh, for being delayed. I really encountered unexpected uh, uh, computer problem. So my computer started uh, updating and then I couldn't connect you on time and then I really apologize for that. Uh, good morning, everyone, and a good afternoon, uh, uh, everybody. Uh, today, I will talk about the Eastern Nile uh, system under three different apportionment. So after I just tried to give you a, a brief background about the topic, uh, I will show you the gap and uh, the objective of uh, our study so that I will pass to uh, the findings and the conclusions that we arrived about those three apportionments that the Eastern Nile Beijing countries have uh, on the table under the current situation. Uh, as you all know, uh, the Eastern Nile countries, uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, uh, have been debating over the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam Filling and Operation Policy for the past uh, uh, over 10 years. And due to that, uh, they have sit for multiple uh, rounds of negotiations and, and multiple scientific communities also with uh, trying to contribute knowledge in this uh, aspect to, 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 to arrive at the most compromised solution on this uh, feeling policy. However, uh, even though this tension between those three countries uh, escalated due to the coming of GERD online, uh, the fact is that, uh, or the actual problem in this regard is not actually the feeling or the operation policy, even so uh, it's the cause for the tension between the three countries. Uh, to understand what I mean by that, it's very important to see the, the speech of the three countries uh, uh, leader they made on the public and at the parliament uh, in front of their people. Uh, for example, back in 2011, the, the former president of Egypt, uh, Mohamed Bursi, once said, uh, quote, we are not calling for war, but we, we will never permit uh, the water security to be treated and our blood is the alternative to losing one drop of water. And in response, three months later, the former uh, Ethiopian prime minister, Meled Zenawi said, I'm not worried about the Egyptian will suddenly invade the Ethiopia. Nobody who has tried that has lived to tell the story. An Egyptian has yet to make up their mind as 
uh, whether they want to live in 21st century or the 19th century. So from this two speech, you will see that it's not about the, the, the feeling policy or the good that they are talking about. It is about giving and taking uh, a drop of water and uh, whether it's they, they're gonna lose for that or not. Even recently after a week, uh, one of Egyptian uh, minister Yasir Abbas said, the Sudan will benefit from GERD in terms of generating electricity and reducing silt and the flood. But only the condition that there is a binding tripartite agreement. So regardless of whether the GERD benefit or not, uh, this minister clearly mentioned that uh, the binding agreement is uh, very essential uh, to solve this critical uh, disagreement between those countries. So uh, from those speech, uh, from those speech, uh, we can clearly see the, the mindset of the three countries who are uh, participating in the negotiation process in the past and uh, in, the in the current time. Not only just, I just showed you this as a, an example. Uh, if you go back and see in 1970s, and then even if you see recently, uh, the leaders of those countries uh, say to their people and their representative is uh, the speech that has the same tone uh, in terms of its content. And this exactly represents the exact mindset of uh, the countries uh, in the negotiation process. Even to achieve this mindset goal, uh, you will see in the negotiation process when the downstream countries uh, follow a strategy of associating things uh, like upstream development issues with significant impact and the existential threat. And on the other hand, the upstream Ethiopia country it tries to defend uh, those issues uh, from the equitable share agreement point of view. So, uh, I'm losing uh, full control over my slide. Oh, okay. So, you will see that while the, 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 the exact uh, uh, problem or undercover interest of uh, the countries is uh, the issue uh, of maintaining status quo versus securing watershed of uh, the Nile. Uh, however, the negotiation up to uh, now uh, only focused on uh, looking for a compromised uh, good feeling and operation policy. Uh, alone. And due to that, uh, the proposed uh, solution by different scholars and uh, different organization couldn't just narrow down the difference between countries. And still, uh, even though the, the effort of the African Union to bring the Parian countries around the table uh, couldn't result in, ma in major uh, breakthrough. So as a result, still we are seeing uh, the tension between uh, the three Riparian countries and uh, agreement. Oh. So uh, due to this, uh, uh, you, you, you will see that the exact problem is uh, the need for uh, all-inclusive water apportionment agreement uh, than uh, a single dam operation policy or filling policy, or exactly the gap or the problem is the absence of all-inclusive uh, apportionment. And currently those countries, uh, for example, if we just, propose uh, a policy that those three countries by themselves agrees on it. And uh, if another come, another dam uh, became online and then uh, you'd see the interaction between countries, the same vicious cycle uh, will, will, will start continuing. So uh, just focusing on a single dam operation and filling policy will not bring uh, a sustainable uh, solution. So 
due to that, if we just focused on so it's all inclusive apportionment uh, agreement, uh, currently those three countries uh, claim uh, three alternatives to be uh, a binding or a legally binding agreement uh, uh, over the Nile. Those options are uh, the colonial share and uh, the Washington DC proposal from downstream uh, countries and uh, the equitable share from the, the upstream countries. So by understanding this uh, and uh, considering the interest of the basing countries uh, in this uh, uh, all-inclusive agreement uh, finding, we just aim to evaluate and understand the, the, the performance of three apportionments claimed to be binding by these three countries. Uh, those uh, uh, three apportionments is, uh, that the three basin countries want, wanted to be a binding agreements is colonial, the Washington DC proposal and the equitable share apportionment. Uh, to just briefly highlight what those apportionments mean, uh, as you all remember, uh, this colonial apportionment is a bilateral agreement between Egypt and Sudan that was signed in 1959. And it assigns a volumetric apportionment to uh, the two downstream countries, Egypt and the Sudan, out of 84 billion meter cube, uh, while Egypt entitled 55.5 billion meter cube, Sudan uh, obtained 80.5 and 10 billion meter cube is apportioned for uh, uh, evaporation and uh, nothing for uh, upstream countries. Uh, and the other apportionment types uh, that those countries ag uh, argued on it is uh, the, the Washington DC uh, proposal. Uh, as you all remember, uh, this apportionment was uh, proposed and designed by US Department of uh, Treasury uh, partially in collaboration with the World Bank. And uh, this, this uh, apportionment was uh, intended to serve as a binding agreement between three countries during drought uh, condition on the uh, Blue Nile basin mainly. And when you summarize it, it has three major uh, policies. So as you can see from the table, for example, if the drought happened for one year or drought happen per year or annually and uh, and if that drought resulted in the inflow of blue nile that falls below 37 billion meter cube while gird is filling uh, ethiopia is required to release the entire annual inflow that is below 37 and additional water from the gird and in the same manner, if, uh, if the same amount of water came while uh, uh, GERD is under operation or in the post-filling phase, uh, in the same way, uh, Ethiopia is obligated to release the entire annual inflow plus additional uh, annexed amount of water that is shown in the table in the document. Uh, whereas if the prolonged consecutive four years uh, drought happened and, and the amount of inflow to the system uh, falls below 37 BCM uh, during the GERD filling phase. Again, uh, Ethiopia is expected to release the entire annual inflow plus 62.5% uh, of uh, the water stored in the GERD that is above a little bit uh, upper than or higher than the minimum operating level at stage uh, 603 uh, above mean sea level. In the same way, uh, uh, Ethiopia releases annual inflow plus 100% of the storage during the operation way. So it's the same way uh, when the cur I mean, the annual inflow to the Blue Nile system falls up below 40 billion meter cube and during and after the GERD uh, filling. So this is a summary of what actually the Washington DC proposal uh, looks like. Actually, uh, previously, uh, Dr. Wasano has already uh, really talked on it in detail and I'm just trying to just remind you what those apportionments are. And 
the other uh, apportionment type is the equitable share apportionment uh, that we have uh, I, didn't, I mean assessed uh, in our two past uh, uh, studies uh, in the in our, in our two past studies uh, we have tried to quantify the equitable apportionment of the Nile basin countries based on the United Nations Water Convention uh, that came into force uh, in 2040 and it's uh, it, it, it's now uh, under the operation uh, in the International Court of Justice. So the, the, the convention has uh, about, the convention has about uh, seven major factors that should be considered for allocating the water uh, among riparian countries. And uh, on its article, uh, six uh, sub article two, it also clearly mentions how the weight of the seven factor uh, should be assigned, saying each factor's weight to be determined by comparing the relative importance of uh, each factor by comparing with the other. And it doesn't actually uh, say uh, use this weighting technique so that we just uh, uh, try to. Uh, quantify the weight of uh, those seven factors using different weighting techniques as, it, as the convention just uh, left it open uh, for uh, negotiating countries or the riparian countries. Uh, Professor Asafa, can you make for me full screen? Can you hear me? Yeah, what do you want? Do you want to get it? Uh, my slide is very far from me and I can't see it. Oh. It's not in the full screen mode. Okay, uh, it's on full screen on me over here. Let me see now what they can do. Okay, let me see now. Let me try to share again. Okay. What does it look like now? Ah, uh, okay. I think still I have to request you okay. to get remote control access. Yeah. I've given you. Okay, yeah, perfect. All right. I don't know if you guys can 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 say it, but it's still on my side. It's uh, a little bit zoomed in. Anyway, I will try to explain it uh, by just saying from distance. Anyway, we can see it from here. Yeah, it, I mean, okay. Okay. So uh, it's those uh, waiting technique uh, uh, or waiting methods that we apply for those seven factors and 25 sub factors under them and then 65 indicators uh, that produces around 88, uh, 88 uh, equitable share scenario uh, of the, the Nile Basin countries. So uh, by using this weighting scenario input to our model uh, in our past study, we have quantified uh, the share of countries. Uh, and then the output actually looks like, and as I already presented it on um, my, some portion of it on my previous uh, uh, presentation. Um, I can actually say it anyway. So this is uh, what the result uh, actually looks like uh, uh, from my previous uh, presentation. So if the 
expert sweating technique uh, is applied at the factors level and uh, the same at the sub factors level and that sub factors weight is uh, equally distributed to the indicators from the blue nile sub base in ethiopia sudan and egypt uh, share will look like and in the same way from other uh, basin countries so if you apply different weighting techniques uh, due to this weighting technique variations or difference, you will see uh, some shear difference that is attributed from it. And this, this shear uh, difference is not actually only attributed from the weighting technique. Of course, it's, it, it depends on uh, the country's score for each indicator too. So it's, it's generally this apportionment uh, study that we just adopted for a comparison in this study. So we have those three, uh, three apportionment is that uh, each country claims to be a binding agreement or respected at, at the current time. So we, we aim to uh, see the performance or efficiency of those uh, three uh, apportionment is in terms of uh, basin wide and a country wide uh, uh, success. So to do that, uh, to do that, uh, we just try to uh, develop a model and set up the model uh, in a way that can enable us to measure key performance indicators. For this purpose, uh, we just selected uh, a water resource management model of uh, Alberta Environment and Parks of Canada. This model is uh, a well-tested model for about 50 years in, in the past in Canada provinces to allocate water between cities, provinces, uh, between farmers and a different uh, uh, streams. Uh, especially focusing on this uh, water right of uh, individuals, states and cities. So the model has basically two components. Uh, the first component is where uh, we define and introduce our uh, hydrometrological database time series like precipitation, inflow, uh, evaporation and all uh, demands. The other section is where we define the, the simulation control file. So uh, in, this, in this section, uh, mainly we define the simulation period and cycle, uh, the connection of physical schematics network and priorities of uh, uh, streams, countries and apportionment is, and initial reservoir levels uh, on the period that the simulation was uh, made. So in this model to automatically uh, replace those three apportionments that we were talking about uh, without uh, interfering manually, uh, we also tried to couple a program that is developed by University of Ufala called Ostrich with the, the worm. And every time the simulation wants, wants change, it will read from this Ostrich program. So those three apportionment types were defined in the ostrich and then the ostrich will uh, plug each of them at single grip simulation in the worm. So finally, the worm produces uh, uh, the following key performance indicators on monthly basis. Uh, those key performance indicators that we measured for each apportionment types is the, the capacity or the ability to generate energy uh, the irrigation, the water allocation for irrigation, uh, municipal and industrial use, the, the amount of water that is uh, evaporated from dams, uh, and the amount of water that remains in the channels and uh, the way reservoirs uh, in each country respond to the, the, the each policies. So because of uh, the, prior the different priority matrix we also define, we do have a lot of uh, simulation, like thousands of simulation. And to manipulate those files, we just use the R script. And basically uh, to screen out the, our uh, simulation, 
we just uh, employed two tests uh, based on the United Nations Water Convention. Those two basic requirements are the ability to, to, to suffice the vital human requirement mandatory uh, order. Okay, uh, I, I will try to increase my volume, but I'm still having a hard time to just see my slides. Uh, okay, I'll try to increase my volume. And the other requirement is Article 20 of the UN Convention uh, that, that requires uh, to meet uh, the environmental flow when uh, uh, impl implementing a certain uh, policy. So if any of uh, the assessments we made fail to satisfy those two requirements, uh, they are sub subjected to rejection or just decline. Uh, if they pass those two screens, uh, we far just we further go to uh, compare individual policies and uh, see their relative uh, impact or implication on the on the system. Um. Okay, so this is uh, what the, uh, the, the Eastern Nile uh, uh, system actually. Professor, is there any way I can, I can display uh, the slide from my end? Uh, yeah, 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 please go ahead, yeah. yeah. But we'll, we'll... are also claiming they're not seeing the... Uh... Yeah, please, yeah, go ahead, yeah. If you are, yes. Okay. I'm going to stop the share here. So please launch your presentation and go ahead and share it. You are a co-host already. Can you see it right now? You have to share it. Did you share it? I did. I can't see it. Okay. Share a screen. Yes, I did actually share uh, my screen to all of you. Uh, can you exit from your side? Yeah, I, I, there wasn't. There is no any sharing. I mean, you, you are you are welcome to share your screen. I can't see your screen here. Candice, can you see? No, I can't see it either. But you should be yeah. able to share. If you click the share screen, the green button on the bottom of your Zoom window, mm -hmm. um, then there should be a bunch of different, you know, like desktops that that give you the option to share. Pick the one that has your um, your slideshow on it, and then it will show up for us. Yeah, I did. Mm. We're not seeing it on our end. Can you try now, Yared? Okay, share, multiple share. And there you go. Okay. Can you see it now? No. That's sad to see this. Um. Oh, 
Okay, let's go back to your stuff. We can see it now. Can anybody see now? Uh, can you see my no. screen right now? No, I no, can't no. see it. Okay, I see I modern see. run simulations. Okay, let me see now. I don't know why, maybe. So, okay, let me share a screen. Can you see now, Eric? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so so it's 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 this model that we uh, employed uh, for assessing those uh, yeah, the performance of those uh, three apportionment times I already uh, mentioned about, and uh, this is the what the physical schematics of the Eastern Nile looks like uh, all the way starting from Lake Tana to uh, uh, Nile Delta or Delta in Egypt to Mediterranean uh, from the Blue Nile, of course, and starting from downstream of uh, Sud wetland to uh, Khartoum on the White Nile, and then the other route is uh, from Takeze uh, River to uh, Atbara uh, on the Takeze Atbara uh, River. Uh, so this is the, the, the schematics that we introduced for our model and then uh, there are details in it and maybe it's not visible and so we can share you the slide. Uh, I can't do uh, nothing right now. So after we just set up the model in, in this way based on the requirement of uh, uh, the United Nations Water Convention. Uh, rules and the principles or guidelines. Uh, we run the model under uh, three major conditions. Uh, the first condition typically represents what the basin uh, looks like under the current situation, uh, in which uh, the irrigation efficiency uh, ranges between 60 and 70 percent, and the return flow uh, that's applied. Uh, the water that is applied uh, to uh, the irrigation field is uh, written will not return to back to the cor the course of the river. So, uh, so we just uh, assume a zero uh, return flow from the irrigation schemes. And the other uh, consideration is uh, the assumption that. Uh, the highest one dam drawdown level will be maintained uh, at 165 above mean sea level uh, uh, as per the Egypt, Egypt's request on its proposal in 2020. Uh, the other consideration uh, that we take into account in, under the base scenario is uh, the existence of varying hydrologic uh, regime. Uh, this is uh, very important for tourism. One, to understand the performance of the system under different hydrologic conditions. And the other is uh, to compare the Washington DC proposal that is uh, uh, designed for informing the drought condition policy. So under, uh, for this reason, we just consider a prolonged drought, normal condition and wet uh, uh, conditions, uh, especially uh, in the beginning uh, of uh, the, the time series or in the beginning of the GERD feeling phase. To do this, uh, 
uh, we just employed the standardized precipitation index on the time series the inflow time series we have and uh, we we uh -huh. we identified the extreme uh, four year uh, drought drought inflows drought inflows from the time series and again normal and the with with uh, flow from the time series so that we we assumed as those four consecutive dry normal and the wet uh, inflow time series will happen when the GERD starts filling. So this is what uh, base scenario means. So it typically represents uh, the actual irrigation efficiency, return of flow of the, the system. Uh, Egypt's in, uh, interest to maintain the highest one dam at 165 uh, above mean sea level uh, all the time. And the three hydrologic condition when the GERD uh, starts uh, filling. The other two what if scenarios are, um, uh, we just assumed uh, a 5% irrigation improvement, 5% uh, uh, return flow from irrigation schemes. We also modified Egypt's interest to return, uh, to maintain the highest one dam at 165 all the, all the time to 160 above mean sea level. And on the third or scenario two, we just uh, assumed uh, just removing any any restriction on highest one dam water level uh, maintenance. So once we just uh, uh, run the model under those three conditions, uh, uh, we just generated our result uh, in the following manner. So if you see the base scenario, uh, the performance of the system under the base scenario assumption, uh, first you can see uh, the system's performance uh, uh, in terms of energy generation, particularly during uh, uh, GERD filling phase. So as you can see from the table, mm, uh, you will see the target energy demand, or, I mean, target energy generation uh, of each countries and as a basin when you just sum it down. And if, if the GERD, the four uh, consecutive years of uh, GERD feeling uh, is started by uh, a drought time, and in that time, if the equitable apportionment is implemented, uh, you can see that Ethiopia can generate 70 to 80,000 of uh, gigawatt hour energy out of 20,000 uh, target energy. But uh, for the other, the Washington DC proposal and the, the colonial share, you can see that the, the Ethiopia uh, can only generate less than 1,000 uh, gigawatt uh, hour of energy. Uh, from the two policies, if the first four years of GERD feeling uh, uh, phase uh, started in, in the drought time. Whereas if you see the, the energy generation of Egypt and Sudan under these conditions, uh, uh, pretty much like 80, 89 to 99% of the target energy demand uh, can be made uh, regardless of any apportionment types uh, you implemented. However, if if the the feeling is started, uh, uh, or if the four consecutive years during the start of the GERD is normal, and in that time, if the equitable share that I explained it previously is implemented, uh, still. Ethiopia can generate more energy, like 400, 400 more than more like 400 gigawatt hour than the drought time, and still the colonial apportionment by itself will uh, start improving, but still uh, it's very uh, minimum as compared to the the country's target energy uh, demand. However, uh, whatsoever the hydrologic regime uh, is assumed in the initial GERD filling phase, you can see that both uh, the Washington DC and as a colonial apportionment shares 
uh, will produce uh, very little energy for Ethiopia, even though uh, it doesn't change for uh, Egypt and Sudan. And the main, the main thing that will be affected is the Ethiopia's energy demand and then the, the entire uh, basin-wide uh, energy uh, generation. So if you see the basin-wise energy generation under uh, the drought conditions, the equitable share actually can make can 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 make 92 to 96 percent of uh, the actual target energy, whereas the colonial and the, the Washington DC proposal cannot uh, achieve uh, at the 50 percent of uh, the demand. So that is uh, what actually the energy generation performance under the base scenario uh, looks like for those three apportionment types. When we see uh, uh, after GERD became full, uh, the colonial, I mean, the, the, the equitable apportionment actually still shows uh, over 1,000 uh, gigawatt hour in both uh, drought and wet season improvement. Because once the GERD became full, uh, there is a constant energy generation uh, that is expected more than when it's uh, underfilling. Whereas uh, you don't see any change uh, uh, through the Washington DC and the colonial share. I will show you why that's happening when, when I will display the, the water levels uh, uh, in, 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 in the next slide. So when you see the, the irrigation performance, uh, this is actually uh, the actual irrigation demand uh, that we took from the Nile Basin Initiative Strategic Plan. And Ethiopia's current irrigation demand is close to uh, 2 billion, and Sudan's, South of Sudan is close to 30 billion, and Egypt's demand is close to 59 billion meter cube. So uh, when you see uh, the deficit that will happen out of this demand, uh, while GERD started filling during the, uh, the drought time, the drought time or four years uh, drought time, uh, the equitable apportionment actually uh, uh, will not reduce any deficit for Ethiopia. And even you will see a, a five to six billion meter cube uh, uh, deficit in, in, in Egypt's irrigation. So, Whereas you, when you see the Washington and the colonial share uh, apportionment performance in terms of meeting the irrigation demand of the countries, uh, you don't see a such significant uh, deficit in, 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 in both countries, Sudan and Egypt, uh, when it just uh, resulted in deficit. So the, 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 the figures that you are seeing uh, in the tables are the deficit in billion meter cube per year on average when the GERD uh, starts filling uh, with four years drought uh, in the beginning and normal and wet conditions. Uh, if the four years or, uh, in the beginning of garden filling became normal, uh, of course, as the inflow to the system increases, uh, a five to six billion meter cube uh, deficit that we see in Egypt will start dec de declining or uh, start eliminating. So, it will come up to one to 1.5 billion meter cube. Uh, if it's wet, you will see uh, almost the performance of the colonial share and the Washington, I mean, the equitable share becomes more or less uh, the same with, with little bit differences. So this is when, when the, the, the system is, uh, under the GERD filling uh, system. But in the post, in the post GERD filling phase, uh, once GERD became full, uh, because Ethiopia's uh, current development cannot absorb the, the, the actual apportionment as I said in the equitable share, uh, beyond fully meeting Ethiopia's irrigation demand because the, the entire uh, Ethiopia's apportionment will go to down or released to downstream countries, Sudan and Egypt. Uh, you don't see uh, those 
deficit that I displayed uh, that happened in the, in, during the GERD feeding phase. Rather, uh, the equitable share and the Washington DC proposal will, will start performing in the same way. So uh, in the post filling phase, uh, we don't see a five to uh, six billion meter cube of irrigation deficit that happened in the Egypt uh, during the drought time. Uh, one thing to just uh, keep in mind here is uh, the four, five to six billion meter cubes that you are seeing uh, in Egypt here, or eight to 12% uh, irrigation deficit that you see here is uh, while high as one dam contains 78 billion meter cube. Uh, the reason why this is happening is we just restricted the high as one dam based on the Egypt centers to maintain high as one dam at 165 uh, meter above mean sea level, regardless of any hydrologic regime, uh, as it expects additional water release uh, from uh, the upstream. So, it's this this huge deficit is happening while uh, hard contains 78 billion meter cube in 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 in, in storage. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the other key performance uh, indicator that we see for comparison is uh, the water loss from the dams. So when you see the water loss from the dams. Uh, if the first four years of the GERD filling phase starts with drought and equitable share apportionment is uh, uh, implemented, uh, overall, the, the basin will uh, evaporate 60 to 60.6 billion meter cube under equitable share. When it comes to the Washington colonial, uh, it's uh, higher than the equitable share by 1 billion meter cube uh, uh, for all hydrologic regions. Uh, when uh, GERD is under filling. But in the post filling phase, uh, because both uh, high swan dam and a GERD became full at the same time, uh, the system will start to, uh, evaporating additional 1 billion meter cube of water uh, from the system uh, under the equitable shape, even that is uh, much higher than uh, the Washington and the colonial. Uh, share unless the water is diverted for either irrigation or some other steam. So in the post filling phase, the water loss will be higher for equitable water share because the, it will allow high as one dam and uh, GERD to become at their full supply level. Well, the fifth parameter or the, the, the performance indicator is uh, the reservoir's water level. <laughs> that was the focus uh, uh, for about the past 10 years. So if you see uh, uh, the way Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam fills, if the first four years of uh, the time series is assumed or considered to be drought, uh, the 88 uh, equitable share scenarios uh, will perform in a way that I'm showing you on my cursor. So there is a possibility that Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam can become full within eight to 12 years, depending on uh, Ethiopia's entitlement for its uh, highest share or uh, lost share uh, uh, from the table range that I show you previously. And, and among many, many studies uh, that agrees with this range, uh, King in the poll 2040 also uh, shows uh, or agrees with this uh, uh, policy, even though uh, uh, the study doesn't say uh, the, the policies I suggest is uh, equitable water share. As you can see, uh, the red and the purple line, uh, it both shows the colonial and the Washington DC proposal. Uh, there is no way uh, the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance uh, Dam can be can become fully operational or can become can attain its full supply level uh, by both policies if the first four years of uh, the filling phase starts with drought. Uh, on the other hand, for the same uh, hydrologic regime, if you see uh, the highest one dam. 
uh, the black dotted line you see on the up the, the, on the top is uh, the ideal uh, water level of higher Suhanda and the blue and the red lines are the Washington DC proposal. And as you can see, uh, Egypt's uh, need to maintain higher Swan Dam will not be, uh, of course, uh, violated by two apportionment types because uh, all the time, the higher Swan Dam water level will be above 165 meter of mean sea level. Whereas because the, the, the equitable apportionment share uh, allows GERD to retain or hold water from the Blue Nile, and it will force the, 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 the higher Swan Dam uh, to release uh, water from, for, for its downstream uh, streams. And then uh, you will see a decline in uh, higher Swan Dam water level. But because of the restrictions that we imposed based on the Egypt's uh, request in 2020 proposal, it won't go uh, below this uh, level. And you will see the recovery time to become full again it takes about 18 years uh, if the filling is started uh, under four consecutive drought years. Whereas when you see uh, Sudanese dams, uh, the five Sudanese dams that we, 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 we mm, included in our model, Rosier, Jabraulia, Keshem al Gibra, Meroy, Senar, uh, all of them uh, were not observed to exhibit any, any as such uh, significant water level fluctuation, even though you will see some uh, deviation from the, uh, the ideal water level uh, requirement. So because this is uh, happening, one, uh, the, the demand in Sudan is uh, very lesser than even the colonial apportionment. Uh, it's about 13 billion meter cube that it, uh, Sudan's uh, irrigation will consume. So the colonial apportionment will give Sudan about 18 billion meter cube. On top of that, the, 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 the equitable share apportionment also adds three to 9% uh, share than the colonial apportionment. And then you don't see when the Sudanese reservoir uh, uh, is affected uh, by any of uh, uh, the policies. Uh, and the other is, uh, if the reservoir is uh, uh, started feeling, uh, if the four years of the first, the beginning four years of uh, the reservoir feelings are normal, and the equitable share will enable GERD to fill within six to uh, 10 years. Uh, and this filling policy also agrees with uh, Mulat and Amogas' uh, filling policy suggestion that they published in 2040. And again, uh, even if the, the GERD started filling in the normal condition, although there is improvement from the drought condition, uh, there is no way uh, Gerdi became full by two uh, apportionment types. Whereas uh, because the hydrologic regime shifts and more water is coming into the system, uh, you don't see uh, such a significant drop down in, in, in the highest one dam. And of course, there is a, a drop in water level compared to the two apportionment through equitable share. But it is not like that of the, the drought uh, scenario. And the recovery time for higher swan dam is also shorter than the previous one. Whereas if the GERD starts feeling, uh, if the four years, uh, consecutive four years of uh, GERD feeling uh, are wet years, and there is a possibility that uh, all of the equitable share scenarios can enable the girl to fill within three years. While again, uh, the two apportionment scenarios do not enable uh, the girl to become full, even though the Washington DC proposal uh, says it will become full, uh, but actually it doesn't. And in, in, in the Washington DC document, you will see the GERD uh, to reach uh, a maximum of 625 uh, meter above sea level. Of course, 
in the which years it will reach once and and you will see when it declines uh, after that so there is no way gerd became full uh, by the the, the two uh, apportionment types uh, again for this uh, weight condition scenarios uh, you will see that uh, almost the, the equitable share uh, performance in the same manner as uh, that of the, the colonial and the Washington DC proposal. So even though uh, for one year, it, the, the highest one dam reached uh, through equitable share uh, up to 165 level. So you, you, you can see that it will immediately start to recovering and then tries to perform in the same manner as that of the colonial and the Washington DC uh, proposal. And the sixth parameter uh, that we saw is the environmental flow requirement that I just uh, showed you in our model. So as you can see, the, the black dotted line indicates the ideal uh, environmental flow requirement at the Ethiopian Sudan border on the, the, the Blue Nile course that we take from International Management Institute, UMI. Uh, you can find this data online so that they share it for free. So, if you compare that ideal environmental flow requirement at the Ethiopian Sudan border on the Blue Nile course, the red line uh, shows uh, the release from GERD uh, uh, through the colonial apportionment, while uh, the dark uh, green kind of color indicates the equitable apportionment. So as you can see from the figure, uh, the, the, the colonial uh, uh, release from the GERD uh, tries to mimic uh, the lower as well as the peak flows uh, of uh, the environmental flow uh, requirement, whereas the equitable share uh, was seen to respond in different way. Uh, as you can see, the when you see the equitable share uh, uh, plot, uh, there is a four times higher uh, flow release from GERD during non-rainy eight months, and you will see about 40% reduced peak flow release during summer times. That, that is happening because, uh, because the equitable share is, gives uh, Ethiopia the right to use uh, 39 to 45% of the, 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 the balloon aisle. So the GERD will hold that amount of water. So when you see the implication of uh, this plot, uh, when the equity, I mean the colonial uh, flow release actually uh, represents more or less uh, the normal flow of the channel, the equitable share actually uh, tries to reduce uh, the peak flows by up to 40 percent and and tries to add the dry time dry season flow by four times higher than the normal natural flow and as this will facilitate uh, additional uh, amount of regulate additional regulated flow for uh, Egypt and and and, and Sudan uh, during dry uh, seasons and it will reduce flood during uh, summer times uh, uh, this is the, the results that I showed you up to now are for, for the base scenario that typically represents the current situation and the needs of the states. Uh, if we just assumed some improvement uh, on, on uh, highest one dam uh, drawdown level restriction to just 160, and we assumed a 5% irrigation efficiency and 5% return flow improvement. Uh, you can see that there is a higher improvement in Egypt's irrigation deficit. Uh, almost 50% of the irrigation deficit that we see in the base scenario will, will start eliminating uh, during uh, the drought season when equitable share is implemented. Whereas even during, due to the efficiency improvement, uh, the Colonial and the Washington DC proposal even performs by far better than the base scenario for, in terms of irrigation. 
Whereas by making this change, uh, you don't see much change on Ethiopia and 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 uh, in Sudan. Uh, again, uh, by doing so, because uh, we allow uh, hard to release uh, a five meter uh, stored water from 160 to 65 to 160, uh, there is also additional one billion meter cube of uh, water loss that we 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 can uh, conserve. So additional one billion meter cube can be saved uh, by adopting uh, the assumption in scenario one. Uh, regardless of the hydrologic uh, regime that you see. And uh, the, the highest one um, also responds for equitable share in this way. And because we restrict the highest one dam drawdown at 160, and the, 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 the plot also looks like, and you don't see any change on the Washington and the colonial share uh, in terms of highest one dam uh, response. When it comes to uh, another uh, assumption, we, we just removed any any kind of restriction on highest one dam, and we see what will happen to the system, and uh, and surprisingly, you can see that when you just remove all all uh, highest one dam drawdown level barrier, uh, you can see that the equitable apportionment during drought season by itself uh, will result very little amount of deficit on Egypt. Uh, so the main reason why I'm focusing on Egypt is because uh, the equitable share will, 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 will was seen to uh, introduce higher amount of deficit than the other uh, two apportionment. So it's it's almost less than one billion meter cube that even you see during drought conditions. And in terms of evaporation, because again you freely allow higher swan down to drop down. And again, you will save uh, again additional one billion. And totally, when you compare the best scenario and the scenario to around three billion meter cube of uh, evaporation, will be saved through equitable apportionment than uh, the Washington DC and the, 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 the colonial uh, share. Because both uh, policies will allow higher swan dam level to remain uh, above 178 and so forth. And the equitable share will force the highest one dam to, to become below even 165 and 160. That's why this uh, water saving is uh, seen in Egypt through the equitable share. Uh, again, regardless of uh, the hydrologic uh, regime when the girl starts spilling. This is what it looks like if we just uh, removed uh, any any restriction on uh, GERD drawdown, and it could reach up to 150 uh, meter above mean sea level, and we also forced uh, a three meter buffer above the minimum operating, and and it it reached up to 150 meter above mean sea level, and then it takes uh, longer time even to recover, as you can see it from the the plot. So what, can, what we can conclude from this finding is uh, among the three available alternative uh, apportionment alternative for uh, the three debating countries, in terms of uh, basin-wide energy generation, water loss conservation, flood control, while the equitable share performs better than the Washington DC proposal, Whereas in terms of uh, securing the water level of higher swan dam uh, and meeting the, the, the irrigation demand is in Egypt, both the Washington DC and the colonial shares are uh, ideal. And the other thing that we saw uh, is when the equitable share enables the girl to fill within three to 12 month, uh, years, uh, depending on the hydrologic conditions, uh, the two apportionment will not enable uh, guard to be careful at any time and then it's not expected that those can those apportionments uh, can result uh, guard to become fully operational and this could be one obstacle to to just bring uh, riparian countries toward this uh, uh, the negotiation table and the other thing that we saw is if uh, if Egypt is interested to maintain uh, the highest one dam uh, uh, at 160 meter above mean sea level all the time, and 
is implemented with equitable share apportionment. Uh, Egypt can face uh, a five to six billion meter cube of uh, irrigation deficit, while high Aswan Dam contains 78 billion meter cube. So that this is uh, the efficacy of this, this, this proposal is as such not uh, uh, attractive uh, for, for the way forward. And the other thing that we see is uh, countries has to take care when implementing the equitable uh, water share, even though the equitable water share uh, boosts the basin wide energy generation uh, by 90 to 96 percent of uh, target energy and, and, and decreases the deficit depending on uh, the way it was implemented. On the other hand, in the post-filling phase, uh, the equitable share was seen to increase uh, basin-wide evaporation when both high Swan Dam recoveries attained and the guard became full. Uh, we, can, we can see about 2 billion additional evaporation can occur. So therefore from this, uh, to just heal uh, the current uh, disagreement between uh, the three countries, it's very important to revisit the existing uh, mindset and treaty of the basin. And it's also fair to say from this finding, uh, the equitable water share is a, a more reasonable vehicle uh, to, to, to take the riparian countries toward this, uh, the agreement and the other two proposals. So by doing so, uh, in one way, when they, 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 they arrive at sustainable solution. On the other way, uh, they also uh, will get a relief uh, for the upcoming infrastructure development uh, that can uh, drive them in the vicious cycle about talking the feeling and the, 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 the operation policy of uh, every single uh, dam as they were talking for about the past 10 years. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, what I have for you. Okay, okay. thank you very much, uh, Yari. Let me stop sharing. Okay, let me see now. Yeah. Okay, uh, now we have taken uh, a little bit over uh, the time that we have anticipated uh, because of the technical issues. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to repeat what Yari has been saying. Uh, but definitely this is uh, one of uh, a very good document that I've seen when it comes to coming out of uh, you know, the challenges and the quagmire that the three basic countries are currently facing, looking into alternative scenarios of, uh, you know, avoiding conflict as when it comes to guard feeling and operations in the future. So uh, with that, I'm going to now open the floor for questions and comments. So you can... Uh, go to, I think you can, you can raise your hand if you want and, uh, or maybe send me a comment and then I can also read from the area. Okay, uh, Dr. Lema. Let me unmute myself. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. And thank you, uh, Wanda Miare, for the uh, uh, presentation. I, I will go to my question quickly. Uh, while you have checked, most of the major assumptions, maybe I missed it, but you didn't check the assumption that the first four years uh, would be a drought uh, type years. And that's, to me, at least uh, uh, the, the, the first two years now of the filling of the reservoir have been uh, above average years, if not outright wet years. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, do you plan or have you assessed the uh, impact or implication of what has happened uh, uh, in terms of the initial two years being already what they are? Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Maybe you can gather a couple of them and then the area can respond all of them together. Okay. 
Okay, then in the meantime, Yarid can respond to Dr. Lamas uh, questions and comment, and then we go from there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lama, for your question. Uh, of course, uh, as I already mentioned it uh, in the in the beginning of uh, my slides, uh, uh, the assumption or the the, the assumption of our analysis uh, uh, taken into account the initial uh, feeling phase actually, and uh, we were uh, analyzing. Uh, this study uh, by the end of uh, April, so that we didn't actually consider the second feeling by the time, and it actually considered uh, the first feeling phase. However, uh, regarding the consideration of the, the hydrologic condition that is happening right now, uh, we didn't actually based on that, because uh, as you know, uh, even though the, the, the past two years uh, are uh, consecutive uh, two wet years, uh, the next year or the upcoming uh, years could be drought or, or, or normal years. And uh, what we try to assess is uh, uh, based on what if uh, that happened, uh, how those apportionment uh, will perform in, in terms of basin-wide operation uh, is what we focus to show uh, in terms of comparing uh, those apportionment is for, for informing uh, the upcoming negotiation on what to uh, focus uh, than uh, what they were doing in the past 10 years. So we didn't actually uh, 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 taken by what is going on in terms of hydrologic uh, regime happening in the in the, the balloon air basin now. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, any questions or comment for Yarid? So Yarid, I have a, a question for you. Uh, we have been uh, saying that uh, the problem that we are facing in the Nile Basin is because there was no inclusive negotiations and discussions on how to share the water. At the beginning, it was uh, UK uh, on behalf of Egypt that determined how much water Egypt has to get. And then later on, it is Egypt and Sudan. And now in your scenario analysis, the equitable sharing, we still consider the three countries, but we talk about now 11 basin countries. Are we really maybe going into the same problem of excluding the other basin countries when it comes to water sharing? I know this might help us avoid the problem that we are in, in terms of filling and operation of the GERD, but I think the Nile Basin has to go beyond GERD. It is, it is an, an 11 basin countries that have uh, you know, different uh, demand uh, for the common good. So don't you think that this should have been a little bit you know, elaborated and a little bit also inclusive in terms of getting more information from other basin countries in terms of uh, what level of uh, agricultural development or what level of energy development they are planning within their basin countries because they are entitled for that. Uh, can I proceed answering? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, that's very uh, fair question. Uh, in our uh, previous two workers, uh, that uh, that was the argument uh, that we were making. Uh, unless and otherwise, all basic countries or riparian countries are included in in some sort of uh, apportionment. Uh, just apportioning the Eastern Nile uh, countries will not uh, bring sustainable solution. Uh, due to that, uh, as I already displayed it in the, in the first uh, slide, uh, the apportionments are not only for three countries, uh, it's for uh, 10 other riparian countries too. But in this assessment, uh, because we are looking for uh, uh, the comparison of the perform, just looking for uh, to compare the performance of the three apportionment items in, in the Eastern Nile region. Uh, we just see the apportion, but the, apport the, the, the equitable share that we quantified includes all other uh, ten riparian countries too. Uh, due to lack of the data uh, we had, 
uh, in the equatorial region. Uh, we didn't actually uh, incorporate it in our uh, model in this study. Uh, that's why you may be uh, uh, called by frustration. Okay, yeah, I can see the challenge, yeah. Tamrat? Um, thank you, Yared, for a great, great presentation. And uh, Dr. Uh, Asafan Kandis, thanks for, uh, um, for hosting this. I have one simple question um, for uh, Yared. The question I have is, did you take a climate change um, effect into consideration when you um, perform this analysis or um, you did not take uh, the climate, te uh, climate change um, into account? The reason I'm asking is uh, on the Western uh, hemisphere where we live, right? Um, climate change has a lot of uh, big impact on um, statistical analysis or um, any kind of modeling. So. Did you take that into account? That's, uh, that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, in short, I, 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 for this analysis, uh, I, I didn't. Uh, I agree with what you are saying uh, to the extent to which the, the climate change is affecting the availability of water resources in the region as well as uh, around the globe. Uh, there is a need to consider that, but uh, in this analysis, we didn't. Uh, the main reason is that, uh, I mean, number one, uh, the, the, the water resource development uh, demand we, we use as an input for the model is uh, uh, the current. And we also uh, mainly focused on just seeing uh, the short term uh, kind of the feeling phase uh implication of the apportionment that we focused and then uh even though it has effect uh, the climate change has effect on on on, on the result but uh, we just assumed uh that one uh, uh as it, it doesn't have a, a such significant impact for the short-term uh, feeling policy indeed it has uh, uh an effect on the long-term operation and then we didn't consider it for that. And then of course we admit that that is a limitation of uh, our analysis. Okay. Uh, any other question? Okay, Abata. Yes, thank you for the presentation and also uh, I appreciate the uh, hostess as well. Uh, in line with the uh, this uh, question that was asked, uh, I saw uh, the environmental consideration also one of the uh, uh, scenarios, could I say, that was shown by Yared. And Yared, what do you mean by that? Can you a little bit elaborate on that? Because you took the drought condition and then the environmental also aspect of it. And the other question is just for, uh, maybe I missed it, uh, you, in the second or third from the last slide, you indicated 78 billion cubic meters for the uh, uh, Aswan Dam. So is that figure right? Or uh, Because I thought it was a lower value for the capacity when you think of the level of the, the, the water in the dam. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, what I mean by environmental flow requirement is uh, the, the International Management Institute actually uh, did some research and then uh, made it available online for, for researchers to see uh, the environmental flow demand of uh, international river around the globe uh, uh, to sustain the ecosystem in healthy manner uh, and when when, when uh, countries perform their development activities to consider that kind of release uh, in the channel. So uh, because Nile is also one of uh, many international rivers, uh, they have uh, a studied environmental flow requirement at every uh, reach uh, that they make it available online. So this environmental flow is an ideal uh, amount of water that 
that should be uh, available in the channels uh, where I just uh, took it as a, as a, a point of reference. That is at the uh, Ethiopia Sudan border on the Blue Nile channel. So at that point, if you, if you take uh, the environmental flow or uh, the water that is required to sustain ecosystem, uh, all living organisms in the, in the, in the channel, uh, the amount of the, the water that uh, Ethiopia is supposed to release in that channel is the one that I showed you in the black dotted uh, line. So it is what I mean by that when I say the environmental flow uh, requirement, but that is actually the ideal uh, environmental flow requirement. But uh, even as you see under the uh, colonial share, it, it cannot be fully made uh, as you see it in the previous slide. Uh, uh, what I mean by 78 billion meter cube is uh, when high as one dam uh, became full, it can uh, contain contain uh, around one, 190, 69 billion meter cube uh, at, one, uh, at a stage where 180 meter above mean sea level is available. But when the water level starts declining from 183 or full supply level down to 165 uh, meter above mean sea level, that uh, amount of water that can be stored at 165 is uh, 80, 78 billion meter cube when you try to interpolate from the capacity curve uh, of uh, highest one dam. So what I mean by that is, so uh, since the interest of Egypt uh, in its proposal is to maintain highest one dam at that level, if we also accept and that and try to maintain that level uh, at any time, uh, at that stage, the highest one dam will contain 78 billion meter cube. But because we restrict the drawdown from that level, uh, there, is, there will be a deficit downstream of the highest one dam uh, in terms of irrigation that will be caused. And then that extent is about five to six billion meter cube due to the restriction we imposed. That is what I mean by. Okay, thank you, Arid. Uh, our October 8th speaker, Dr. Rasad, is going to talk about the different uh, uh, aspects of impacts of GERD on Sudanese dams. Uh, one of them he mentioned in his abstract is environmental flow. So hopefully we'll hear more on that aspect. Uh, uh, there's another question also, two questions in fact from the chat uh, by David. The first one is 1.77 BCM per year irrigation water requirement for Ethiopia. The question is, where did you get it? Will this restrict Ethiopia's future use of uh, the Nile water for irrigation purposes? The second one is, uh, again from David, is a media report about the Washington DC proposal was Egypt current share 55.5 BCM per year, was willing to accept 49 BCM per year prior to January 20. And uh, Egypt willing to accept 40 BCM on January 2020, but Egypt quickly denied it. And US Treasury apparently suggests 37 BCM per year. So which data did you use for this analysis? Are the two questions here. OK. Uh, uh, for Ethiopia's uh, demand, uh, that says 1.77 billion, uh, under current uh, development status, uh, the Nile Basin strategic plan uh, that studied in 2017 shows as the country's uh, current irrigation demand is uh, close to 1.77 billion meter cube under the current condition. However, this doesn't include uh, un unirrigated land that reached up to 2 billion hectares uh, in the Blue Nile alone. So, uh, in the current situation that we are talking about, the GERD feeling phase, uh, we cannot consider uh, the, some of future development in our analysis. Uh, this 1.77 1. 1. billion means uh, uh, it doesn't reflect the future. And uh, we are talking about uh, the current situation. And after, as I said uh, in my presentation earlier, uh, after GERD became full, because those two huge dams started evaporating over 2 billion meter cube additional water, 
this this two billion meter cube of water evaporation can be saved by just diverting uh, and absorbing Ethiopia's uh, equitable share uh, to the future development. And otherwise, they the, the countries can deal on on those uh, water release too. Uh, regarding the threshold that is uh, implied in the the Washington DC proposal. Uh, it's 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 the the 37 billion meter cube that we we take. Uh, if you ask me about the threshold, uh, uh, the threshold by itself has uh, a lot of uh, 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 problem by itself because if you see the the historic uh, Blue Nile flow. Uh, in 1913, there is there is there was a time that the the the, the Blue Nile flow declined to 20 billion meter cube, and that threshold is very higher, a little bit, uh, not only a little bit, like it's very higher than uh, 20 billion meter cube and 31 billion meter cube. You hear all the time as uh, the lowest or dry time flow, so. It's not 37 or 40 billion meter cube that we considered as a, 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 a drought time uh, annual inflow. Rather, it's it's uh, the historic minimum inflows that our 12 uh, months standardized precipitation capture that we bring into the front in the, the first four uh, extreme drought conditions uh, as, a, as a, a representative of drought conditions. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Yared. Uh, another question from Chardros Mulgeta on the chat is, uh, I know you, Yared, you have not done uh, or considered uh, this uh, joint operation and management of the dams and reservoirs within the basin. Uh, but the question is, what about uh, having a joint operation and management of the catchment as a whole, whereas you, you share also the benefit and the challenge? Uh, that way, uh, maybe you can actually come out of this challenge uh, having a consensus between uh, among the three countries. So joint operation and management uh, at the catchment level, and then of course share the challenge as well as the benefits. Yeah, uh, it's, it's after, after uh, we know those, uh, the implication of those apportionment is that we can, we can uh, proceed to uh, joint or unilateral kind of cooperations uh, uh, at the basin or at the country level uh, that we can proceed. Uh, as I understand, uh, once we just agreed on uh, uh, which way or which track uh, countries uh, should follow, the next phase is how, how to implement the, a certain kind of apportionment type. Uh, for example, if countries agree to implement the equitable share, of course, uh, there are benefits and there are also challenges that come with. Uh, the benefits are, as I just said, uh, there will be a huge boosting of energy generation that countries can uh, sell or uh, just share one another to, 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 to just light their nation. On the other hand, uh, the challenge is uh, the existing mindset. I mean, when one country uh, loses its share for the benefit of the other country, uh, there should be some sort of uh, a compensation modality that, that, that the countries uh, should talk on it. And, and when that kind of approach uh, starts uh, emerging, uh, the, the, the the higher level of cooperation will go to uh, upstream water resource development, uh, conservation workers, and so and so forth will be come just after they just uh, uh, start thinking about uh, the, uh, the the basin wide uh, or uh, just considering Nile as their uh, own resource. So I believe. Uh, the joint operation or uh, other sort of uh, a joint uh, infrastructural development will come after those countries agreed on which track they have to go. Uh, in situations they are in the uh, crossed line, uh, saying one uh, wants to sustain the status quo and the other wants to just drag those countries to the equitable share. 
uh, you, we can talk like uh, cooperation. That will be like a, a diplomatic term in just simple uh, expression. Uh, and it will facilitate a diplomatic championship like uh, we are seeing uh, right now. So I believe uh, the joint multi-operation, cooperation, and uh, those kind of terms should come after uh, agreeing uh, the equitable share. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I think uh, there are preconditions for those to happen first. I think there has to be a, a mechanism for at least the three basin countries to sit down together and agree on the rights of water. So uh, that's very, very important. First, before you proceed and talk about the joint operation and cooperation and management. And we really have seen the last couple of years that even, uh, even though we are favored by the wet years, uh, the last two feelings uh, has almost minimal, minimal impact or zero impact in terms of the, the subtractive nature of the dams. Uh, the issue was floods. Uh, was that because of the dam? Might be because of not cooperating, not talking, not sharing data but collaborating on how to exchange information. And that will be actually the topic of our discussions in three weeks, exactly three weeks from today. So yes, there are different scenarios uh, that uh, the Basin countries uh, has to actually explore and go from there. They shouldn't be actually somehow discouraged by a short term uh, you know, deviations from uh, the usual uh, water sharing that they are getting. I think they have to look into a long term uh, benefit of uh, there is no denial that these countries are actually connected by the river. History, culture, so many things. Whether they like it or not, the Nile will flow across the boundary. They have to talk. It's very, very important uh, for the benefit of uh, all the countries within the basin. Any other questions for Yarid? Okay. Any comment? Okay, it's now uh, 9.48. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Yared, for uh, doing this while you are on travel. And uh, I'm sorry also for the inconvenience uh, we had at the beginning, but uh, we were able to make it. Hopefully, we will see you in three weeks in another special uh, panel discussions that I announced earlier. It's going to be uh, extraordinary. It's very, very important. Uh, you know, after the second feeling, we have seen some floods in Sudan. Uh, was information exchange data sharing could have avoided this? Uh, let's see, you know, what uh, the panel discussion will bring about. So please share uh, the announcement with other colleagues. We'll be very happy to see many of you. So we'll have uh, on August 31st, we'll have on September 13th, and we'll have on October 8th. We will not have in November, because in November we have an, uh, an international conference. Uh, hopefully you all have received, please submit abstract uh, by August 20. So students and uh, presenters from developing countries are actually uh, free uh, to register and please send your abstract by uh, August 20. Uh, so we'll see you in three weeks. Thank you very much again, uh, everybody. So uh, good afternoon and also good evening for some of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.